Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. We have a lot of announcements, so I just invite you to stick with me and keep track at home. Uh, first, I want to invite you to turn to pages 14 and 15 of your service folder. Uh, it is there that you will see the written announcements, so I invite you to take that home and ponder it deeply throughout the week ahead. Um, I do want to make a special invitation right after this service, the Boundary Waters uh, reunion meeting brunch will take place in classrooms A and B. So do uh, make a point of stopping in if that is uh, something you'd like to participate in or be a part of. Uh, afterwards, we also have our uh, local uh, Cub Scout group, 122, has popcorn and wreaths for sale as well. So you can support them uh, and their work within our community. That'll also take place through those double doors. That'll be in the cafe. Uh, we also have an announcement in there about the prayer vigil, but rather than listen to me, I'd like to invite up my friend Alice, who can speak to it personally. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to invite you to the prayer vigil fr this Friday. It starts at 7 a.m., goes till 5 p.m., and what happens is people come in here and pray in shifts of 20 minutes or more. Uh, it's all set up uh, a nice, uh, silent, private uh, time to meditate and pray and uh, just reconnect with the Lord and uh, speak about whatever is on your heart. We also take prayer requests and those prayer requests then are prayed for all day long. So if you have something in your heart you would like us to pray for, please submit a prayer request either in the foyer or um, we have a sign up page on our website and you will find a link to um, fill in a form to enter a prayer request. Um, please submit them by the end of today. And then also if you're able to come and pray Friday, we welcome you to come. We have plenty of slots open in the afternoon. Um, it's just 20 minutes and again, um, no experience necessary. There are greeters here to help you. Um, and it really helps to have someone in here all day long praying, uh, lifting up prayer uh, from our community. Um, and again, you can sign up in the foyer or on the sign up page on our website. Thank you. All right, and thank you for that. A couple other quick notes. Today is Elm Tree Sunday, so we are thankful for all of our guests from Elm Tree downstairs making it up here. They're gonna share some music with us in a little bit. Hello. Uh, we're going to be sharing some music in a few minutes. It's going to be lovely. Oh, you're waving to your mom, not me. That's okay. Now, 
Thank you. See? Um, so we're thankful for that. A reminder, too, next week is Reformation Sunday, so make sure you are wearing your red. Uh, it is a lovely opportunity for us to reflect upon our heritage over 500 years since the Reformers uh, began their work in, in a church that is yet still reforming. So that'll be next Sunday. Next Sunday is also our in-gathering Sunday. It's the Sunday of the year where we uh, culminate our stewardship campaign. We have the pledge cards available. They're online. You may have gotten one in the mail. There's some at each of the check-in stations as well. Uh, we'll be uh, bringing those forth next Sunday as well. Uh, this year's theme is Growing in Faith Together, Gifts. Uh, and we've taken time the last three weeks to reflect on the various gifts that we have offered to the world around us through our benevolent gifts as a congregation. So we've been able to highlight a lot of different organizations around us in the community and in the world. But today we're going to highlight something special. We're going to special uh, take special attention to those organizations that exist within our own building. We're going to highlight two of them right now. So first, I'd like to invite up my friend Lisa, who would like to share some words uh, from our hands and feet ministry here in St. Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Since 2007, Hands and Feet Community Outreach has been serving DuPage County families by giving personal care and household items that can't be purchased with SNAP food stamp assistance. Um, there have only been a few instances, you could probably count on one hand, that we haven't been open because of inclement weather and with the pandemic. Even with the pandemic, we were only closed for two months. Uh, we devised a plan of pre-packed bags and a drive-through system that held us through to help, still be able to help the community during that time. Um, we are in the uh, basement of the church, in, next to the elevator in the ARC room. Um, and we, all that we have is, um, we ask the people to show that they are DuPage County residents, no questions asked. They are able to choose up to 10 items from our list. Um, and Hands and Feet is listed on the 211 number with the health department. We also partner with Outreach House for referrals. A majority of all new families are referrals from Outreach House. Um, over the Labor Day weekend, we had 19 new families just on that one single day alone. And for this past month of October, we saw our total number of families served rise to 76. It hasn't been this high since the pandemic. Our highest number of families served was 130 families back in 2012. Hands and Feet is a nonprofit that runs solely 100% by volunteers and donations. Any donations that we could really use right now are paper good items like napkins, toilet paper Kleenex, um, feminine pads, and also for the month of December, we collect all the $10 gift cards to give them as a special treat for December. Um, we also accept shoes and boots in good condition so that they can get two pairs up to two pairs of family per month. And if you ever have any inclination to join us down there and volunteer, it's every, um, first, every first Sunday of the month. Um, you don't have to sign up and do it from now until eternity. You could just do it when you're able or if you want to uh, when you are able. But you can um, go on our website for the items that we need and for the list of who to contact for do uh, donations and volunteering. Um, there's also the setup back there in the cafe. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we are going to be inviting you, if you want to go and have a conversation with Lisa, sign up to serve or whatever the case might be. She, uh, in the purple shirt, is your person, so you can check that out uh, after services. And also, as, as we mentioned earlier, it's Elm Tree Sunday, and so I'd like to invite up uh, the Elm Tree director, Maggie, who's going to share a few words of, uh, of thanksgiving to on behalf of Elm Tree. So take it away, Maggie. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maggie Fedak, and I'm the director at Elm Tree Christian Child Care. Uh, we have a bunch of our families in the, with us today, and up front we have, uh, have most of our teachers. Is Miss Carol and Miss Carol's over singing with choir today. Um, I have to read off of my paper because I get really nervous when I talk in front of lots of people. <laughs> um, 
Okay, Elm Tree Christian Child Care, previously St. Paul Christian Daycare and Kindergarten is a nonprofit child care center founded in 1975 and governed by a board of directors known as St. Paul Outreach. And we are also housed downstairs in the basement here at St. Paul. Uh, we have uh, Karen over here is our current board president. Uh, I saw Mark here, uh, Amy is on our board. Um, do we have any other board members here today that I'm forgetting to introduce? Anybody? Well, we have a couple more on our board that are not here with us right now. Um, the first official meeting of the St. Paul Outreach Board of Directors was held on February 1st, 1975. As a result of this meeting, the Child Care Center opened its doors in September of the same year and we started with just 13 students enrolled. The center quickly grew to capacity, which was 20 children at the time, uh, by the end of the second year of operation. In 1979, this board approved a kindergarten classroom to be added and started with 13 children being served in that classroom. In 1981, that's when we had our first daycare Sunday. Um, it was established and the children and their families were welcome to sing at the second service at St. Paul. Fast forward to now and following the construction, it was decided to rebrand with the new space. We are now licensed as Elm Tree Christian Child Care and the name pays homage to Elaine and Les Madsen, um, Karen, Karen, our board president's parents, and our founders. And we are now home to 33 children and their families. We have a small but mighty program and 11 wonderful women on staff. Since opening, we've served more than 1,000 children in the community. Uh, next September 2025 will be our 50th anniversary. Uh, thank you all for your ongoing faithful support of us and the families we serve in our community. We look forward to another 50 years serving the community and being a ministry of St. Paul. Thank you. So one of the things to, to, to make mention of, and this is why I think it's a lovely way to sort of bring this all to a culmination, is this idea that one of the gifts we share is our physical spaces. And that's a true gift that we sometimes lose sight of. We have a beautiful uh, set of spaces recently and faithfully renovated by your generosity. And now we're able to empower these groups to better serve the needs uh, of not only their ministry, but the community that they serve. So again, thank you to Hands and Feet and to Elm Tree and for all these organizations that you support here at St. Paul. And with that now, let us turn our hearts towards worship this day, and we do that with our call to worship on page two of your service folder. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we gather together in our worship, let us rejoice in sharing the gift of God's peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us take a moment to share a sign of that peace here this day as we rise together for our gathering song, Peace Be With You.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Together we pray. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The assembly may be seated for the reading this day. Our first reading comes from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken and struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave for, with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Though him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We're gonna do deep and wide. Remember this one? Show me deep. What does deep look like? What does wide look like? Deep, <laughs> wide, you got it. Ready? One, two, three, ready? Deep and wide, deep and wide. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide. One more time, ready? Deep and wide, deep and wide. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide. 
This time I need all of you, don't you dare sing a word, we hum it. Are we ready? I know you guys know these words. Here we go, ready, one, two, three. Oh, very good. Oh, good luck. I, th this is my all-time favorite. Miss Kristen taught me this one. It's the P song. If you hear a P word like pterodactyl, it means that you go down. When you hear another P word, you come back up. Follow along as your body allows you to. All right, here we go. One, two, I, did, I, did I say three yet? <laughs> All right, here we go. One, two, three. I like to praise Jesus in sunshine. I like to praise Jesus in rain. Whenever I praise my Lord Jesus, I find peace in praising his name. Here we go. Ready? Praise him, praise him, praise him with Peter and praise with Paul. Praise him, praise him, praise Jesus, the Savior of all. Oh, good job. All right, you can all have a seat. Thank you. You guys stay up here for the children's message. Oh, you're stuck. I got you. Come on up, the rest of the kids. Now, I want you to count yourselves lucky, because normally we do the peace song twice and we do slow motion the first half and super fast motion the second, and I usually pass out. So, here we go. Friends, friends, friends. Welcome up, everybody, for my children's message. Today, today I'm gonna do something that I was told in seminary to never, ever do. I am going to ask you a question with the potential for answers I do not want. But I'm gonna do it anyway. So my question for you today, are you ready? What would you like to ask me? If you could ask, yeah, right? If you could ask pastor anything, what would you ask pastor? I, I asked the question, what's your question for me? Thinking, does anyone have a question for me? Here, I'll give, you, I'll give you a starter. First service, I was asked, how old are you? And it was said with a tone of derision, if I may say. You're, you're just throwing numbers out. I'm almost 37, thank you. What is your question today, Ava? You always have good questions, Ava. I know this about you. What's your, if you could ask pastor any question. Do I'm gonna come back to you? Okay, what's your question for me, Dominic? Your puppy is 18, more of a statement. Maybe the question was, are you older than my puppy? In which case the answer is about twice as old. Yes, what's your question? How old am I? Okay, we've already, man, we're retreading. Okay, here's the good news. The good news today is pastor got off real easy, okay? But my point is, is that sometimes we ask, oh, do you have, what's your question? Oh, that is so, 17 years are so gross. I know, just tell me about it, girlfriend. So, sometimes we ask questions and we're not really sure what the answers are, or maybe we're not even sure why we're asking the questions. And today, James and John are gonna ask a really important question of Jesus. And what they find out is that maybe they're not even asking the right question. So here we go. Jesus and his disciples walked along a dusty road. James and John had something to ask Jesus. They ran to catch up with him. Out of breath, they said to him, hey, Jesus, could you slow down a minute? Jesus stopped, what can I do for you? The brothers asked, we want to ask a favor. We were wondering if maybe in heaven we could sit like right next to you, one on your right and one on your left. Jesus looked at them and said, you are good friends, but every person has a special place in heaven. No one gets a place that's more special than anyone else's. Jesus called the disciples together. He told them the best way to serve him was to serve others. He helped them understand that he had come to help people and wanted them to do the same. So James and John are brothers, and they come to Jesus and they ask, oh, Jesus, Jesus, can you give us a special place? And Jesus tells them that question doesn't even make sense. 
Because in my world, in my kingdom, in the heavenly realm, all of you have a special place. And so sometimes we have to be reminded that we already are loved by God. We are already given a special place of honor among God and God's people. And that is such a gift for us today. Just like your gift to me was not asking me any difficult questions. So with that, let's go ahead and let's pray. You can repeat after me. Ready, friends? Here we go. All of you can join me. Dear God, Dear God thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with us. And giving us. A special, place a special place in your kingdom. In your kingdom. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, you did an excellent job. You may return to your seats. The rest of you may now rise for our guest gospel acclamation here this day. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The assembly may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I am sure I am not alone in this experience, that moment when you're doing something and suddenly you are confronted with terms and conditions. You're innocently just trying to sign up for seven free days of Hulu, and next thing you know, you are reading the fine print. And if you're anything like me, you take this as an opportunity, and you begin to read the fine print. Tiny, tiny print with probably very large legal ramifications, but again, I don't just sign anything you put in front of me, so I get to work. And about 10 seconds into reading, I realize I have no idea what I'm reading anymore. It could be the back of a shampoo bottle for all I know. But at this point, I'm committed, right? Because I don't just sign things. I don't just click, I agree. I want to understand the terms and conditions. I want to show that I did my due diligence. And then I finally, after the 12 seconds, lean back and go, yeah, that looks right. Yeah, that all checks out. Good, good, right? And then I click agree. But I do that because I'm almost a lawyer. I was in like pre-law for like a semester about 15 years ago. So again, with a brain like this, I know everything is in order. So it's fine. I click agree and I move on with my day. But then, then I have that moment. The little voice in the back of my mind goes, really? Do you really know what you agreed to? Are you sure you wanted to click I agree? But you see, that's life, right? Sometimes we just find ourselves in those moments, but how big of a deal could it be, right? Terms and conditions, they're all over the place, so who cares? You click and you move on. But these things, as it turns out, have real life implications. Just a few months ago, actually, there was a very important court case predicated on terms and conditions. It had to relate to the Disney Corporation. A woman died of a severe allergic response to food that she consumed while on a Disney property. And the problem was there was a miscommunication about the ingredients. One of them turned out to be fatal for her. 
So when her widow went forth to bring this court before the, the case before the court system, they were told, oh, we're so sorry. Because like four years ago, you clicked I agree to the terms and conditions on your Disney Plus account. And buried in that language was this, this sort of phrase that made it clear that you cannot bring such lawsuits before a court or before a jury. So we're really, really sorry, but you clicked I agree. Now, thankfully, the legal system has worked through this process, and last I read, it is going to move forward. A settlement will eventually occur. But the point is that terms and conditions sometimes can actually be a life or death sort of a thing. Certainly, it's the case today with James and John, who are confronted by the terms and conditions of discipleship as they converse with Jesus, as they ask for a particular place of glory and honor at Jesus' right and left hand. But I think it's important that before we go any further, we take a step back. We understand how did we get to this point? Well, at this point in the gospel, the 10th chapter of Mark, they are traveling, Jesus and his disciples, to Jerusalem. And they've been told not once, not twice, but thrice, that this is an important journey, that this journey is going to culminate with him suffering, dying, and rising again. And three times, it seems that the disciples ignore what he's actually saying to them. This is the glorious fate that awaits him and awaits them as well, but they are simply not listening. Their response is dismissive at best and laughable and tragic at worst. Essentially, his disciples, upon hearing that, go, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's super nice. Hey, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. I want you to take a moment. I want you to just think about that. Hey, Jesus, before we ask you a question, we want you to promise you're going to say yes. Now, if any of you ever had a child in your life before, you would know this ploy. It's a familiar and often used one, right? I know what I'm going to ask you is a big no, but I want you to promise you're going to say yes before I ask it. Therefore, it's legally binding. You will have agreed to the terms and conditions here, right? We've all been there before, and sometimes we've even fallen for it. And so Jesus, I can only imagine, rolls his eyes, right? But this, of course, stirs up some controversy. Because we find out that the other 10 disciples upon hearing this become angry at them. And I can only imagine they're angry because they didn't think of it first. Had they known that that's how you get what you want from Jesus, they probably would have done it earlier. So now you've got this conflict sort of broiling up. And then it's amidst this conflict, it's amidst the confusion and the misunderstanding that Jesus does what Jesus does best. Jesus steps back and says, you know, Maybe this is an opportunity for us to all learn. And so Jesus helps him to contemplate the ramifications of the terms and conditions of which they are setting. And Jesus immediately responds him by saying, you don't understand what you're requesting. You don't know what it is you're agreeing to. But of course, that doesn't stop. Jesus says, okay, fine. You think you can drink the cup I drink from? Great. You think you can be baptized with the baptism from which I was baptized? Super duper. And they both respond, uh, yeah, yes, we are able. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, come on, guys. Come on. How, how could you ever think that? What's wrong with you guys? You've been traveling all around. He's told you repeatedly what's going to happen. How could you possibly not understand? Well, let's be kind, first of all. But second of all, I can speak from experience. As somebody whose job is to faithfully administer the sacraments, baptism, and Holy Communion, there are times where I don't think I fully understand what I'm doing. There are times where I don't fully grasp the holy mysteries that have been entrusted into my care as a professional, as a pastor. But luckily, Scripture does us a great favor today. Jesus does us a great favor. He lays out for us the terms and conditions of these sacramental practices that stand at the center of our faith, our faith as disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with the cup, the cup that we want to share. Holy Communion. As we know, not too long from now, this meal is going to be instituted by Jesus right before he dies. Right? He's going to have that moment that we call the Last Supper. 
It's what lies ahead of him when he arrives in Jerusalem. And he does it in the shadow of the cross. Death looming over him is the backdrop for this moment, for this meal. A meal where he offers his whole self, his body and his blood broken and poured for the sake of others, pouring himself out in the midst of the tension of this moment. In fact, James and John are allowed to see behind the scenes. They're two of the select disciples that get to go into Gethsemane with Jesus, and they get to hear him pray. They get to hear Jesus say, I am deeply grieved even until death. For Father, you, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. This cup is a cup of glory. This cup is a cup of forgiveness. This cup is a reminder of the defeat of death itself. But in the moment, as Jesus is instituting this practice, Jesus knows that it starts with death. Resurrection always starts with dying. In the case of Jesus, it's literal. It's Jesus hanging from the cross. It's him breaking and pouring out his blood for the sake of all of humanity. But for the disciples, it begins with death as well. For us, it means dying to the old way of living, a way that is self-centered and instead putting God at the center of our lives, learning to serve rather than expecting to always be served. Then there's baptism. Baptisms are great. I love me a good baptism. There is nothing better than a very polite, not crying baby, freshly baptized, being paraded through the community of God's people as we welcome them in this glorious moment where they are forever marked and named as a beloved child of God. And there was never a more glorious baptism than that of Jesus. I'll give you a quick recap. When Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, the skies tore apart, a dove came down from heaven, better translated as a pigeon, but doves are probably prettier. This dove comes down, the Holy Spirit incarnate, and then a booming voice yells out, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. That is a watershed moment. Those are the kinds of moments that we expect in our life of faith. Those are the moments we hold on to. The challenge is, baptism isn't just a moment. Baptism is a lifelong commitment. That moment where the water pours over us or we are named as a beloved child of God is not the end, but indeed in many ways it is a new beginning. Next week, we're going to celebrate Reformation Sunday, the faith of the Reformers for over 500 plus years. And we're going to hear about Martin Luther and his contemporaries. And this is what Luther had to say in the small catechism about baptism. That daily the experience of the old self sins and all must drown. So that a new self can rise forth. A self that is centered in God's faith and God's mercy and God's grace. Baptism is a daily drowning to our old self that a new self can rise anew. But we hear more about baptism in scripture itself from John the Baptist, a guy whose last name is baptism for goodness sake. He must be a good authority on it, right? John the Baptist, when he calls Jesus forward, when he calls people forward, says, come, come. This is a baptism of repentance and forgiveness. In other words, baptism is about turning one's life around, reorienting one's life back to Christ, back to God, back to a new way of living. That's that big word, repentance, that carries so much weight for us. And then John points to Jesus and says, even more so, is that this baptism I give you is just water. But that baptism, that baptism is filled with the Holy Spirit. A spirit that that blows around us, a spirit that burns within us, a, a spirit that will forever change the way we experience the world around us. A spirit that calls us to serve rather than expecting to be served. A spirit that flips the world on its head, where the first will now be last and the last will be first. A spirit that measures greatness, not with wealth or power or control, but with love mercy and compassion. Those, 
Those are the terms and conditions that we agree to when we come forward as disciples in Christ, as we come forward to share this holy meal or to be washed in these very waters. And like James and John, sometimes this feels really simple. Yeah, of course, this all sounds great. Yeah, obviously, I, I want the, this lifelong forgiveness that I get in baptism. Obviously, I want that weekly reminder of forgiveness I receive in this body and this bread broken and poured for me. But I got to tell you, as a pastor who is entrusted with faithfully administering these sacraments by you, the community, more often than not, I don't actually think it's easy. Fact. More often than not, it's overwhelming. Every week, I get up here and I preside over the table. Magic hands is what we call it in seminary. <laughs> and through that moment, right, suddenly bread and wine and grape juice become body and blood broken and poured. And every time I do it, I get that same voice in the back of my head, are you sure you know what you're doing? Are you sure that you should be up here? Are you sure that you really believe this or that they really believe you? And it's that little seed of doubt that takes hold and it's powerful and it echoes, it's humbling, but it's there. And that's a really hard place to be because surely if I, the pastor, can't do it, how will the community that follows me do it? But that's the point, it's not about me and it's not about us because it's in those moments where those seeds of doubt begin to take hold and take root, that we are reminded through the grace of God that we are loved. We are loved. And the best thing about God's love and God's grace is that it is unconditional. So thanks be to God for providing us that unconditional grace and love that we can carry with us this day and always. Amen.
Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation, responding with the words, hear our prayer. Creative one, we give thanks for the delicate balance of the natural world. Kindle in us a spirit of caring strength in the preservation of habitats, food availability, and centers of refuge, that all wildlife may thrive. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. Empowering one, fill the leaders of governments with spirit of service that prioritizes those on the margins due to job loss, underemployment, unsafe working conditions, and immigration status. May economic equity be achieved for all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Abiding one, you call pastors to shepherd the congregation toward faithful living as servants and followers of Jesus. Inspire all ordained ministers and seminarians to ministry that challenges, engages, and comforts those in their care. Bless our pastor, Reverend Zachary Wagner, and pastoral intern, Vicar Nicholas Brining, in their service to our community. God of grace, hear Hear our prayer. Restoring one, send your angels to watch over, rescue, and protect those who are injured or ill. Nurse those who suffer hardship, disease, injury, or difficulty with your comfort and peace, including those on our prayer list and all those we name aloud or in our hearts. God of grace, hear hear our prayer. Saving one, we give thanks for the disciples James and John and all saints who have faithfully served you. We rejoice in a promised place at the feast of victory that we receive by your grace alone. God of grace, Here's we entrust these and all our prayers to you, Holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. And now we pause to give thanks for all the gifts that we offer this day, our time and prayer, praise, and thanksgiving for those things that we receive and that which we leave behind that continue to support the mission and ministry we share centered in Christ's grace, love, and mercy for all people in all places throughout all time. So thank you this day for that ongoing generosity. And with that, I'd invite the assembly to rise as you are comfortable in doing so as we respond to that generosity with our invitation to the table. pray. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life and so of all the choirs of angels with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn
which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, broken for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people. For the forgiveness of sin, do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We gather at this table of God's mercy and forgiveness. All are welcome. Young and old, believers, questioners, and questioning believers, we gather to be fed because we are all beloved children of God. All are welcome. There is a place for everyone, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, color, culture, or socioeconomic circumstance, for Christ is our host, and we are all honored guests. All are welcome. I'd invite the assembly to be seated, and I would welcome those communing at home to take and to eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And to take and to drink, for this is the blood of Christ shed for you. For those gathered in the sanctuary in a moment, you'll be invited forward to partake in this holy meal. We'll be forming two lines in the center aisle, beginning in the front rows. You'll come forward to receive the host, either from myself or from Vicar Nicholas. You'll then continue along to receive either the grape juice, which is the lighter color, or the wine, which is the darker color. You'll then be invited to consume those elements as you return to your seats along the side aisles. The acolytes will have baskets there for the disposal and future recycling of those little plastic <coughs> cups. We have uh, gluten-free Jesus available if it should so be needed, so just indicate to your server that you would like that. And we also have oversized goldfish for those who do not commune but already have a place at the table. The fish is an ancient symbol of Christ in the early church and a reminder that we all have a place at Christ's table.
May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, bless you now and forever. Amen. God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And receive now this blessing. God Almighty, God most merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
Thank you.